All right, what's going on, you guys? It's your Julie Master of Sakurai, and we are going to be doing um, uh, another reaction request. <sighs> and it turns out this is the one that I at first didn't want to do because of uh, a, a rude person trying to request it. Like for multiple times without going through the proper channels, just DMing me just at random, you know points on twitter and instagram and stuff but uh it was requested through discord thank goodness and um it's by lankara top the fourth wall and we are going to be discussing it now i want to say this is about the first ben 10 the very first like like season one ben 10 and if that's the case then yeah i'm all for it because i was the one that i, I watched I watched um, the first Ben 10. I wasn't really much of a fan for like, like Ben, what, what was it? Um, Ultimate Ben 10. Uh, even though it was good, I just didn't really watch most of it. Uh, but that's not what we're here. We're here to, to, to react to this. So this is what we're going to be doing. Uh, ben 10 episodes, uh, episode season one, episode one, Episode 9, episode 13 review. Atop the fourth wall. Uh, here we go. Hello and welcome to Atop the Fourth Wall, where bad comics burn. Patreon sponsored review time again. Thus, we're talking about a not comic and not bad thing. I'm going to have to come up with a new tagline for this show eventually, aren't I? I was hoping for a comic book connection, at least, because of a rumor I had heard about this series, that it was inspired by the DC character Dial H for Hero, a lesser-utilized one oh, who had really? a mystical dial that, when he selected the letters H, E, R, and O, would make him into a different superhero with varying powers. However, according to one of the show's creators, Duncan Rouleau, that is actually a myth. He said it was inspired by the Bjork song, Army of Me. And if you've ever listened to that song, yeah, I don't hear it either. To be Hold fit. on. One second. Let me just put that up just a little bit. All right, here we go. He remembered the song name wrong as Army of One, but point stands. Now, Dave Johnson, the art director for seasons one and two, did say it was inspired by Dial H for Hero, but uh -huh. he came onto the project three years into development and was not one of the original creators, a group called Man of Action Entertainment. And further, I can understand why the connection would be there, because Man of Action... We're all comic creators. The aforementioned Duncan Rouleau, Joe Casey, Joe Kelly, and Stephen T. Siegel. I have a difficult time believing that four comic writers wouldn't realize that their concept, a boy who had a device that let him turn into different superheroes, as it was at the time, when Johnson came on it was changed to aliens instead, was similar to a DC character. Sure, Dial H is a bit more obscure than Superman, but from my experience, mainstream writers know all the obscure stuff. There's a reason DC Challenge kept bringing in the people who nobody else remembered. So yeah, a f so Ben 10 is based off of an an old and forgotten DC character. Wow. The more you know. Officially, it's not Dial H with the serial numbers filed off, though I admit I have my doubts. Not that it matters much anyway, because even if that's how it started, it ain't how it ended. The creation of a multi-series franchise. I never watched Ben 10. It came out my senior year of high school, and at that point, I was just not watching a lot of kids' media. Like, Justice League was the only thing I was hanging on to because it was the Timverse. Also, unlike quite a bit of my audience, I wasn't a Cartoon Network kid. Nickelodeon, Fox Kids, and Kids WB. And even Nickelodeon got phased out as I aged out of its demographic. Well, Damn, except for dude. Invader Zim, which I watched in high school because all the high school kids watched it which is also why Nickelodeon canceled it, but I digress. Let's dig into three episodes of Ben 10 and see if it's held up. Well, seeing as how we did a reaction to like a, a, a Ben 10 video, um, the first, I would like to say like the first episodes are okay. They're okay. Because, like, he doesn't start really getting into, like, getting more aliens until, like, later on in the series. It's still good, though. A 
nice thumbnail. Let's get going with the very first episode, and then there were ten. Ten donuts for eleven people. Let's settle this with a death match. We begin in that space, where everywhere. two ships are fighting each other. <laughs> One captained by this Cthulhu-looking dude. The Omnitrix shall be mine. There is not a being in the galaxy that dares stand in my way. Poor fool doesn't realize that it is the Tickle Me Elmo of Christmas gifts this year. Anyway, the being who would totally dare to stand in his way is this 10-year-old named Ben Tennyson. <gasps> would you classify that as a launch problem or a design problem? This brings us to our theme song. It's okay, recapping the premise of the show before the show itself gets to it, but whatever. Although weirdly, near the end as it lists off the 10 alien forms you can change into, the art style suddenly changes. I wouldn't mind the theme song having a different art style from the rest of the show, except it shows clips from the show as well, so it's kind of jarring. Also, while I appreciate that the clips are going for a kind of grindhouse-esque film strip look, presumably because aliens, sci-fi, B-movies, etc. The shaky cam is really distracting and bad. But yeah, song's fine, peppy, almost 60s-esque pop song about the show. I anyway, actually after love the, theme the song. song. It's back to noise filter I know, elementary see, the, school. The, the very reason why I wasn't into Ultimate Ben 10 because the song, I didn't like it. I like this song way more than the Ultimate intro. The Ben 10 Ultimate Intro. I I I I, I like the like the uh, the tune of, of this theme song. That was what had me hooked to watching Ben 10. Yeah, no idea what the deal is with the weird texturing and all the background elements. It's not like something horrible that makes the show bad or something. I just find it weird. School's out for the summer, but Ben's teacher asks him to stay behind for a minute because of the paper airplane. Damn it, Ben. If you paid attention in class, you'd know that there are better designs for paper airplanes that are more aerodynamically sound. Elsewhere, a couple of bullies are chastising a kid, informing him that normally they'd beat him up and take his money, but since summer has started, we're gonna give you a break. Now fork over the cash. It's a tough economy, but fair. Ben tries to intervene, and you can see how well that goes. He's brought down by his grandfather, Max, as they're about to begin a summer camping trip in his RV. And much to his irritation, it seems they're now going to be joined by his cousin, Gwen. She's not happy about it either, since she had her own vacation plans. Each activity is color-coded, so I never did the same thing two days in a row. Wait, that just says play video games, but in different colors. Yeah, different games for each color. Eventually, they arrive at the campgrounds. Chow time. Ben, I think your grandpa is one of the bluegill parasites from Star Trek. Either that or a Klingon serving gah. Gah is always best when served live. Naturally, they ask if they can, you know, not eat live mealworms, but he just says this trip is going to be an adventure for their taste buds. Yes, the taste of gagging will be quite a novel experience. Yeah, yeah, live mealworms are in fact safe to eat, so stop your comment writing, but like, they're 10 years old and spending their entire summer with you. Read the room, dude. Maybe ease them into the stuff normally sold as bird food. Back in space, right. the larger ship gets damaged, but they're able to destroy the smaller vessel. As it goes blammo, it ejects something that falls towards Earth. After some more bickering between Ben and Gwen, our title character goes for a walk in the woods as he spots the object falling. Whoa, a shooting star! Whoa, a sniper shooting star! The pod crashes in front of him and opens up, revealing the Omnitrix. A watch? I thought I told you I wanted a Rolex! A Rolex! He reaches out for it, but it actually leaps onto his wrist and refuses to come off. Back at camp... Ben's been gone a while. I wonder if letting the ten-year-old wander off into the dark woods alone was a bad idea. So Ben, I'm pretty sure you're a Green Lantern now. He tests out the Omnitrix and transforms into some kind of fire alien. I'm on fire! I'm on fire! fire and i'm okay and i'm voiced by steve bloom now naturally playing around with his fire abilities starts a forest fire max and gwen spot the smoke and realize that ben might have accidentally done this and so run off into the woods with fire extinguishers gwen comes across the transformed ben and after some back and forth realizes it's him he explains what happened and when i tried to get it off i suddenly was on fire only it didn't hurt when i was accidentally starting this mega forest fire also, there's a raging fire around us, and you are somehow not choking to death from smoke inhalation. What's right. that about? 
Max comes in next, and fortunately we are spared them trying to hide Ben's identity. That being said, Max seems shockingly calm about not only the forest fire, but also that his grandson is now taller than him and doing a really accurate Ghost Rider cosplay. His recommendation to stopping the fire? Backfire. Start a new fire and let it burn into the old fire. Sounds like a really crappy plan, but okay. Yes, a backfire is in fact a real firefighting technique with forest fires, but it's not exactly how Max described it. The idea is that a controlled fire will cut off fuel for the spreading fire so that it won't be able to continue. Thing is, you need someone with a ton of experience to do it, because otherwise, if you lose control of it, you know, you're just making more fire. He does so, and I guess we ran out of time to actually show it in action because we just fade into the park ranger arriving at the burnt trees where he made the backfire. Back in space, Squid Face is in a healing tube from the earlier battle. And you say the Omnitrix is no longer on board the transport? Well, the thing got blown to hell, so everything is no longer on board it. They detected the jettisoned capsule, and he orders a minion to go retrieve it. Meanwhile, Ben finishes telling the full story to the two, and Gwen wonders if he's gonna be a monster forever. He's not a monster. He's an alien. I, I mean, look at him. What else could he be? Fire elemental, mystical H dial, a really extreme advertising mascot for a matchstick company. <laughs> the Omnitrix symbol on his chest starts beeping red and he reverts back to normal. Max decides to go investigate the crash site, instructing the kids to stay there. The minion that was sent down to find the Omnitrix, a very advanced robot, finds the capsule and immediately opens fire on it. Between this and the exploding ship, do these guys not understand that if you blow something up, it's probably not gonna come back? The thing sends out two probes, and I guess leaves the area because soon Max is there and finds some of the debris from the capsule. I don't like this one little bit. I don't think their insurance is gonna cover this. Ben, meanwhile, decides to resume playing with the Omnitrix, hoping to use it to actually help people instead of making things worse, and figures out how to activate it, this time selecting another form, an eyeless, more bestial one. Still, it's got some form of other senses that can detect movement around it, kind of a radar sense. He can't really communicate in this form beyond growls, but retains his intelligence as he goes and swings off into the forest. One of the robot probes finds him and attacks, but he manages to destroy it before the battery on the Omnitrix runs out again. Unfortunately, the second probe shows up, but before it can blast him, Gwen smashes it with a shovel. And the robot catches fire. We're only on the first episode, and these kids have started multiple forest fires. There isn't going to be a single living tree left by the last sequel series, is there? Back at the RV, Ben explains that he's figured out how to activate it and that he can pick between 10 different forms, though he doesn't know why he's having trouble staying in those forms. Max says they're gonna have to figure that out if he's gonna keep using it. Grandparents always spoiling their grandkids beyond what they'd let their own kids get away with. They hear a cry for help over the CB radio. They're being attacked by a robot, and Ben says that people are in trouble because of him, specifically the watch, and that they have to go help. This time, he transforms into some kind of crystalline form and goes to where the robot is attacking, a camp parking area full of RVs. The fight does not go well at first. Sure, he can easily take the hits the robot inflicts, but the robot is tossing him around like a ragdoll and able to leap away from his attempts at slicing at it. Eventually, though, he realizes that his crystalline body can reflect the robot's lasers, and he uses it to redirect one of its own blasts back at it. Later, while Squid Face absorbs his healing juices and rants about the failure of his minions, Ben tries tries out another form that can go at super speed, telling Max and Gwen that he had some business to take care of before their vacation really started, putting the bullies into the tree like he had been in. Ben Revengerson. The patron didn't specify why <laughs> they chose the three episodes they did, but now we're skipping ahead to episode nine, The Last Laugh. As such, I apologize if there was a bunch of context in the episodes between these that I'm missing out on. We open on a pier where some thieves are loudly bragging about stealing from a yacht, until the creature from the Black Lagoon decides to strike. If you're supposed to be the superior race of the universe, why don't you try climbing after us? It's of course Ben in a more amphibious alien form as he leaps out of the water after him. 
The thief knocks over a hot dog cart, which leaks gas from the fuel tank under it. However, it also causes a spark from a loose wire that starts a fire. Ben 10, the story of how the world was engulfed in flames. Ben makes a sudden shocked reaction face to something off screen and cut the theme song. What actually happened was that in the ring of fire, the oxygen was burnt up and he suddenly couldn't breathe. Fortunately, he saves himself by punching a hole in the dock and dropping back down into the water. And then he leaps back up to knock out the thief and leaves him to the cops. I don't care what anybody says. You circus freaks are okay by me. Just uh -huh. please stop working for the Joker. I Wait, is that why this episode is called Last Laugh? Our heroes are traveling around in the RV and spot an ad for a traveling circus. Gwen and Max want to go, but Ben doesn't really care for it. Besides, it's pretty late. Ben, it's 11 o'clock in the morning. Really? Then why does the establishing shot look so dark and gloomy? Are you entering a bad thunderstorm? Ben is very clearly not happy by the images of clowns, and honestly the circus isn't doing itself any favors when those images are so damn ominous. Fortunately, we have an appropriate counter-representation to evil clowns with my good friend, Boffo the Clown. Mm. You know, at some point we really need to think of a better joke for you than just being casual and doing my taxes. Okay, the jukebox incident was like nine years ago. Move on to a new thing. Uh -huh. Carnival Barker shows off the attractions, including a strong man, a woman with prehensile, super strong hair, and the usual- I did not like these three. I legit did not like these three. And, for, and, and, and furthermore, I didn't like the fact that this was just disgusting. Why, did, why, are, you looking, why are you so disgusting, dude? Usual thing in a circus. Some kind of Cenobite looking dude with Ugh. acid breath. Oh. Soon to be moving up to Cirque du Soleil next year. Ben sneaks off and sees a clown in their dressing room. You're gonna knock him dead. Hey, how'd they record how I warm up to do this show? The show starts and the ringmaster announces the star of the show. Zombozo the Clown. <laughs> how does anybody find it's that funny? It's so funny how you stand there. He then does a bit where his clown car is a bull and it runs into his red cape and the car turns into confetti. How is this funny? <laughs> Cars transmogrifying is hilarious! As Ben walks off, claiming he's going to go get some popcorn, Zombozo ominously says people will die laughing and a giant machine begins to glow. Now how about some volunteers? Ah. <laughs> this isn't funny! Ben walks out of the circus entirely to spot the circus performers breaking into places to rob them. He turns into the eyeless beast alien and starts fighting them. Back in the circus tent, the crowd actually seems to be laughing at everything. A result of the device says the strong man comes in to inform Zombozo yeah, of what's going on outside. They, they, they Somehow the clown actually has enough strength to knock device. Ben back, leading the goons to drop a tower on top of him. They walk off and Ben reverts back to normal, allowing him to sneak off. Soon, the circus has disappeared and all the people leave, Max even still giggling while clearly exhausted. Ben soon realizes that Gwen is gone and we see that she, along with a group of other people, are with the circus, serving as a snack for the road or for Zombozo. The entire group of people are still laughing. Turns out the circus just makes everyone incredibly high on weed. Ben and Max are in pursuit in the RV, though Max is clearly tired. It's here where Ben admits his fear of clowns, thinking this makes him a loser. Everybody's got their own crazy fear, Ben. Me, it's White Castle chicken rings. Why are they shaped like rings, Ben? Why are they shaped like rings? Max admits that he conquered his old fear of heights by climbing a water tower. Huh? That sometimes you need to confront fear head on but then passes out, Jesus. forcing Ben to take the wheel and narrowly avoid them going over a cliff. Max rambles about being so sad, but like, while being down and depressed can be tiring, I don't think it quite works like this. I mean, he didn't come across as sad or upset or anything. This is physical exhaustion to the point of passing out. Max recalls that back in the circus tent, Zombozo seemed to drain something that frankly looks like their souls or spirits, but Max thinks he drains happiness completely. The two emotional states of humanity, happy or tired. He's got Gwen. Yeah, we knew that already. What? Ben catches up with the circus and fights the minions I, I, I by transforming into... I don't know why they into, just that. Uh, 
I thought because I thought century. they were going to get Gwen in the first place. Okay, it's actually some kind of alien that can take possession of technology, which he's using to possess an automatic baseball launcher. Impressive that it keeps so many balls in it despite it being considerably smaller than a person. He loses power in the Omnitrix and reverts back as he hunts for Zombozo. He wanders into a hall of mirrors, the clown watching him during this. Hey, Okay, I'm imagining that I'm impaling you with my crystal form. That makes me smile. Zombozo puts him through some kind of surreal interrogation, wanting to know if the eyeless creature was his pet or if it was all him, leading him to fall into a giant spider web. Come on, kid! You've got to learn to loosen up. Yeah, we'll see who gets loosened up when Pennywise files a lawsuit against you, dude. They end up back into the circus tent proper, where the joy draining machine gets plugged into Zombozo's back. Ben asks what this asshole wants. What every clown worth his floppy shoes wants to make people laugh, then drain their positive energy. Bafo, is that what all clowns want? I see. The clown is more a reflection of humanity itself. It's desire for joy and creativity, personal expression, and modifying our appearance to be what we want while simultaneously recognizing that we should be able to laugh at ourselves. That there's a bit of buffoonery in us all, and we're oftentimes silly both when we're alone or when we're with our fellows whom we love to see smile. There is wisdom in a clown. Yeah, yeah, I know I still have to file my 1099. I've got a few months. He calls his joy sapping machine the Psy Clown. Clever, eh? Not really. While the Psy could refer to the psychological aspects of an emotion, it implies something else other than draining it. Same if you're actually spelling it like Cyclone, which, yeah, can suck stuff in, but I think people more associate it with blowing away and destruction rather than draining. C minus. Zombozo shows a heavily drained Gwen nearby, and Ben finds his courage, transforming into a more ghostly form that he can turn invisible with. He punches Zombozo a few times before knocking him into the machine oh, yeah, and destroying it, releasing all the joy back into everyone. You want to see something really scary? Oh god, it's Rudy Giuliani wearing nothing but a thong! It's in my head! It's in my head! Zombozo teleports away in fear and everything's back to normal, though I wonder if Zombozo ever comes back, especially given Ben didn't really try to hide a secret identity during this battle. Let's move on to our last episode, the season one finale, Secrets. That summer schedule that Gwen came up with has a sinister true purpose. The episode begins with Ben using that crystalline form to stop some high-tech thieves, but it seems the news reporting on this is intercepted by Squid Dude from the first episode. I don't know if he's appeared since then, but he's definitely out of the tube now and a bit upgraded. Some people, when they stay in liquid for too long, get wrinkly skin. This dude gets an exoskeleton. He says he'll go and get the Omnitrix himself. Another nightmare, Ben. I dreamed that there were opening credits this time! The nightmares apparently do involve the alien captain, though Ben doesn't know who he is. Max says they'll talk about it in the morning, but when Ben mentions that the being said to him, I'm coming for you now, Max suddenly decides they need to start driving at 3 a.m. Best way to beat the traffic. Plus, I want to grab some McDonald's breakfast. God, I miss when they used to do all day breakfast. They're Me on their too. way to Mount Rushmore, but of course they've hit a pretty deserted part of the road where there's nothing to look at. So Ben is bored. He wants to use Gwen's laptop to play some games, but she turns him down. He uses the Omnitrix to become the machine-possessing alien again to screw with her, but it seems that the aliens in orbit can track the Omnitrix when it's used. Max tells him to knock it off, that they might attract attention by him doing it. Back in orbit... No matter. I know just how to draw this Earthling out. Good job, dude. It took him like 12 episodes to fix the ship, and here you are breaking it again. They launch a full-scale assault on a nearby city, which they spot from the RV. I'm sure the local authorities have the situation well in hand. We think we're dealing with a supernatural being. Most likely <laughs> a mummy. Weird how I keep getting opportunities to use that clip lately. When they blow up a gas station, which looks like a friggin' nuke going off from the RV, Ben transforms into the fire alien and quickly starts blasting robo-bugs out of the sky. As Ben is locked in place for a moment, the squid alien finally reveals itself and his name. Vilgax. You know, they make a cream for that now. Ben recognizes him as the being from his dreams and breaks free. 
but Vilgax is completely impervious to his attacks, and knocks him through several buildings. Still, points to Ben for using his powers cleverly. He manages to melt the pavement as Vilgax advances, slowing him down. However, Max arrives in the RV and clearly recognizes the guy, ordering Ben into the camper as the Omnitrix runs out of juice. He tells them that they do not want to pick a fight with Vilgax. How do you know his name is Vilgax? Grandpa? What aren't you telling us? Look, we used to date for a while, okay? <laughs> I was young, he was exciting, but it was not a good fit. They're soon attacked by more of the robot drones. Things are gonna get a whole lot worse if we don't get to Mount Rushmore. With all the destruction, rush hour traffic's gonna be terrible, and I want to get there at a good time. Also, check it out. They use a bunch of Star Wars sound effects for the drones as lasers. Neat. <laughs> Ben transforms into some kind of bug alien and destroys the drones, but Vilgax has freed himself and grabs hold of our hero. He's able to force him to transform back, annoyed to discover that the Omnitrix is in the hands of a child. When he tries to take it off of him, the device zaps him away. Yes, the Omnitrix is already merged with your own DNA. Of course! Don't you know anything about science? While he takes Ben prisoner, Max and Gwen arrive at Mount Rushmore, driving to a side road where Max uses a hidden button in the RV that uses a Star Trek sound. I love how my show now is just part of a rich tradition of using other franchises' sound effects. This lowers the RV into a massive hidden base and he goes through some storage slots that also use more Star Trek beeps until he pulls out a massive gun, only saying to Gwen that he wasn't exactly an average plumber before he retired. Ah, he was the third Mario brother. On board his ship, Vilgax <laughs> explains that the Omnitrix is part of an ancient power struggle. He wants to replicate it so he can have an entire army of soldiers wielding Omnitrixes, each one commanding an arsenal of powerful alien forms that he can use to conquer the universe. The RV, it turns out, has a lot of advanced sci-fi tech built into it, including a holographic display showing off that it can track the Omnitrix, and yet still only one cup holder. Max hopes that the gun he brought will put Vilgax down for good. Speaking of, his ship prepares to head for orbit, where he plans to annihilate Earth because he's kind of an asshole. Max manages to drive the RV straight into the ship and even collide with Vilgax before he can cut off Ben's arm. One can only hope that there will be a mission like this in GTA 6. Max gets out and shoots Vilgax, the villain recognizing him right before he's blasted. There's a power surge that causes Ben to start rapidly shifting through his alien forms and lets him get free, but they're soon attacked by more drones. All the fighting causes the ship to hurtle out of control, not helped by Vilgax recovering. Ben tackles him off the ship to save his grandpa, landing on Mount Rushmore. The fight soon resumes, smashing some of the heads. Man, the monument mythos got really weird after season two. Vilgax's ship crashes, the RV managing to drive out but getting totaled in the process. The villain soon captures Max and Gwen and threatens to kill them if Ben doesn't surrender. He does so and they go back aboard the ship, but it seems before he left, Max set the ship's auto-destruct. Ben takes up the gun Max brought to keep Vilgax from stopping it and quickly flees the ship. It of course goes kablammo, and Ben manages to land safely in the fire alien form. And so our episode, and the season, ends with Ben telling his grandpa that they need to talk. But we'll do it next season as a hook to get people to come back. These episodes are pretty good. Yeah. Obviously I can't judge the overall like said, the quality of the show okay. based on just three episodes, but they're very enjoyable ones. The story premise and superhero activities are fun and full of creative uses of the various powers, plus the variety of forms helps keep the action and visuals interesting. I'm still confused by the noise filter on all the backgrounds, but it's honestly not that distracting, especially during the aforementioned action scenes. All of our leads are likable, though Gwen has less to do in these episodes, getting the most action out of the first with the shovel to the robot. The banter between her and Ben never gets too obnoxious, and Max being supportive of all this while still trying to be more reasonable and a good grandfather is appreciated. Though given that it's because he's apparently done some alien fighting in his own time. And that's a little disappointing because I think I'd prefer it if he was otherwise in the dark and was just being a good guy. However, none of that is really a big problem. The pacing is a bit weird. Not too slow, but it somehow feels like some of it drags when it really shouldn't be. It's certainly not boring, and I'd be into this show if I was a kid. As it stands, good stuff from these three episodes, and I wouldn't be against seeing more. Next time, Patreon-sponsored review from one show to another, as we once again take a look at some episodes of Kaizoku Sentai Gokaiger. Which will be the next thing we react to. Because y'all requested it.
Ah, uh, you gotta love, you gotta love that. I, I, you gotta love that ending intro. I, the ending outro, what the hell? I said intro. The fuck? So, was the ringmaster in on the whole Zombozo draining people's joy plan, or was he just a temp they brought on to do this stuff? Yeah. <laughs> Hello, my. Oh, thank you, Linkara, for that. As always, um, y'all let me know in the comments down below which, uh, among the first ten aliens, which one was your favorite? Mine was always forearms. I enjoyed forearms. He was tall. He was he, he was he was strong as shit with forearms. But let me know what y'all think about about that. Um. And if you enjoyed this this video, uh, please give give, give it a, a a like, a thumbs up, and yeah, I'll see you in the next one. Uh, go support Lankara. The the original video will be in the description, um, so you guys can watch it yourselves. This has been Master of Sakura. I love you guys, and I'll see you again next time. Peace.